Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's start taking your seats. We'll make a start for the next session. Uh, so we have uh, a bit of a, an international uh, flavor to the session, a, a few virtual speakers. So the first speaker today is, um, sorry, first speaker this afternoon is Professor Dieter Schultz, who's a professor of aeronautical engineering and heads the aircraft design and systems group at Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. Um, professor Schultz, over to you. I, we can see you. Um, yeah, welcome everyone here from Hamburg. And here's my presentation. Passenger aircraft design towards lower emission with self liquid hydrogen and batteries, a little bit pros and cons. And I will have an introduction setting the scene and aircraft design basics, then from urban aviation, short, medium to long range, environmental evaluation, and then more the technologies, new energies, propulsion and aircraft and the summary. Okay, so um, resources or the atmosphere, what is the problem? Um, we have one barrel which says do not empty, these are our resources, and the other barrel which says do not spill over, that's the atmosphere. And for a long time we thought that the resources are the problem, but now we see that the atmosphere is the problem. In between is the tap, and we seem to open the tap wider and wider, but we need to obviously close the tap to solve the problem. Here we see the green deal hit for 55, we have to go down to the green line, um, but so far aviation was moving up um, on the red curve, and uh, we see that 80% of humans on Earth never flew and will probably never fly, so global warming for aviation is more a rich world's problem. There are two schools obviously marching towards zero emission, we have the traditional school and people from the traditional school say, we have to increase efficiency as before. And the critique would be, you will never make it to zero emission um, uh, with increasing efficiency. And the new school says, we have to apply new fuels and we do not need to care about the overall inefficiencies that they have because all energy will be renewable energy in the end and they will be without any harm. And the critique would be, you will run out of energy resources on Earth. You cannot make it. So in addition to these two, increase efficiency in new fuels, there is the idea of the carbon cycle and also about compensation. What can we say to that? Uh, talking about efficiencies a little bit more, um, uh, take that as an example. We have a magic ATM system and it shortens the way by 50%. And then we have a super duper vehicle that is reducing fuel burn by 50%. And some people say 50 plus 50 is 100. So we have made it and have gone to zero emission. But obviously you need to multiply one half by one half. And the result is um, one quarter or 25%. So it's not that easy just by uh, working on the efficiency, you will not make it. But what about the fuels? Uh, electricity does not come from the socket. Um, and hydrogen combustion um, is also not brief effects. There are the non-CO2 effects, but more about that later. And if you go with biofuel carbon cycle, you will not make it 100% efficient because there is an inefficiency in the process. You will only go down to 50, maybe 50%. What about compensation? That may not be sustainable. If you plant a new forest and you cut it down 30 years later, then the carbon is in the atmosphere again. It's also a philosophical question. So aircraft design basics. There's first law of aircraft design, and it says you get the maximum takeoff mass of your airplane from the payload, and you divide by one minus relative fuel mass and the relative operating empty mass. And some people, when they talk about uh, battery, electric um, 
flight, and they say I calculated that the A320 has a takeoff mass which is three times that of today. And I say no, apply first law of aircraft design, and you will see that you calculate one minus something minus something, and it will be negative. And that shows you that your design is not a solution. So it's not very, very heavy. It just has no solution, this attempted design. So we have seen the Breguet range equation, and I was challenged um, by some of my colleagues talking. And here you see the Breguet range equation and you have the speed. I think we just have to get up with the speed to get the range larger. But what you forget is that specific fuel consumption C is not a constant, but it's kind of proportional to speed if you make it a rough estimate. So the CA uh, is constant. So if you put that in, the V cancels out and then you have the glide ratio CL over CD and here you have the mass fraction. Now if you write this a little bit differently and you look at the graph and say roughly, it is this, it's the uh, relative fuel mass, then it all makes sense. So this is the way to interpret that. What about induced drag? Um, if we have an air taxi or helicopter, then uh, the thrust you need is um, the lift, and that's the induced drag uh, to keep the airplane up. And you, so to speak, divide <clears throat> the lift by one. If you have an airplane and it has a glide ratio of 20, then just the uh, induced drag, you divide the lift by 40. If you have a train, then it's easy to keep that up a lot because it uh, has the wheels on the track and you may divide by 700. And if you have an airship, then you divide by infinity. So you see that vehicles are better uh, by physics and you cannot physics, you have to keep that in mind. So the train comes out quite favorable and the car here is uh, a little bit in between. What about propulsive efficiency? Um, it depends on what propulsive device you have. The turbofan is more for higher Mach number, goes up to 70%, turboprop to 85%, prop fans to 90%, but they have a certification problem. And the wheel is unbeatable and has a propulsive efficiency of 100%. So that lets us think if the train or the car wouldn't be better than the airplane. We've seen that jet engines have become better and better um, over the decades. And here we have the gear turbofan, the prop fan, but the turboprop uh, was already down here all the way. And if you have a piston prop, which has not a bypass ratio, but it would be somewhere here below 0.4. And it was already there in the 1950s. So here you also see that it's the physics more than anything else that dictates the outcome. Now let's see how that all applies to um, aviation, short, medium, and long range. So we start with um, mobility. And here you have the flying taxi, and you look at the CO2 output per kilometer, and it's gigantic compared to a car or an aircraft. We get the numbers here from Ryanair. And what we see is <clears throat> that um, air mobility even if you use electric motors, it's by no means anything that would save the world. And here you look at the costs. The air taxi is already there, JFK to Manhattan, and you pay seven euros per kilometer, and a taxi in my hometown is 1.8. So if you have the money, you go for it, but it will also won't get cheaper if you have batteries and electric motors. It will stay the same price pretty much what it is today. So we see that um, air taxi is for the elite. Um, the city Airbus flies for 15 minutes over Manhattan. And if you look at the crowd here, are they waiting for the city Airbus to come along to pick them up? No, the air taxi is not a solution for the traffic problems of today. What about short range? You take an airplane, how can you improve it? Oh, I have a good idea. I put the airplane on track. I don't take batteries but I take it from the grid. Well, that is invented already. It's the train. And the Chinese have made this picture, the train over the clouds. 
Now, what about fuel efficiency? If you calculate fuel efficiency, you see it depends on range. And we have what we call the bathtub curve. When we fly low at a short distance, the fuel consumption is high. If you fly very long range for an airplane where you need to leave people behind to make it, then fuel consumption also goes up. So the train is more efficient, especially when you compare with a short range airplane, an airplane flying short range, it's three times more efficient the train. The train uses eco-electricity, renewable electricity from the grid, and the aircraft has a problem that it also has NOx and uh, aviation-induced cloudiness by a factor of three. So you multiply three by two by three, and you see that the airplane is 18 times worse on short range compared to the train. Oh, by the way, you can calculate the fuel consumption from published data using this equation. What about medium range? If it's medium range between mega cities, here's the comparison between the aircraft and the train from Beijing to Shanghai, and they arrive at the same time. Uh, the train is going 350 kilometers per hour, so it's a distance of 1,200 kilometers. Um, if you wanted to carry the passengers away with an A380, an A380 would need to take off every 10 minutes and the train is more reliable. But not all city pairs are like Beijing, Shanghai, and you need an airplane. And that should be a propeller-driven airplane, a turboprop, let's call it smart turboprop to add a few design tricks. And you could use an engine of the A400M and you use two of them, put it on the smart turboprop to fulfill requirements as for the A320. For 10 years, it has been discussed to design an airplane with more than the 70 seat range, but it never came. This is my proposal here. You have an A320 type TILA aircraft with two big propellers. Uh, you keep all the requirements the same, but you allow the Mach number to drop. You get an airplane which is considerably lighter, 24%. It burns 36% less fuel and it has a cruise altitude of only 23,000 feet, which is very favorable for aviation-induced cloudiness, which is virtually not existing at that point. And you reduce your direct operating cost by 17%. So it's a detailed calculation, as you see in the pie charts. We also worked on hydrogen. Um, there was a big reluctance to invest, therefore I said, don't make it a, a clean sheet design. Take an airplane that you already have, take the A321, stretch it a little bit and put the cabin of an A320 into it. And you need a 4.9 meter stretch. Here you have your hydrogen tanks. And what you find out, the fuel mass is lighter, it's less, but the energy goes up by 46%. So you need more energy. So the idea would be to combine the smart turboprop with the liquid hydrogen. To use that advantage. Here are a few uh, colorful pictures from our design that we had back in 2006, where we designed green freighters together with Airbus and also the Technical University of Braunschweig. The yellow things are the freight containers and the blue ones are the hydrogen tanks. It could also be a passenger airplane with hydrogen tanks under the wing. And now we move to long range. We also design green freighters for long range. And here you see that you need quite a bit of volume in the blender wing body, but also on the tail aft configuration if possible. And when we go back to Lockheed 1976, then you could even go to a range of 18,000 kilometers. If you have something like an A380, where the people only sit on top of the wing and the front and the back are filled with hydrogen tanks. Um, if we want to evaluate all that, we need to look first at the fuel. And I show the bathtub curves here once again, where you can uh, differentiate between your airplanes and you see for what range they are suitable and where the fuel consumption goes up tremendously. And then we come to um, the atmospheric um, effect. 
with the equivalent CO2 consisting of CO2, the equivalent NOx, and the equivalent aviation-induced cloudiness going into equivalent CO2 mass. And here you see how it all works on the environment. You have various emissions. They have changes in the atmosphere. And then finally, climate forcing. And you see that you need to differentiate between CO2, which has a long-term influence, and then the non-CO2 effects, which are short-term uh, influences. Normally, it's all integrated up to 100 years. But if you use another time frame, then uh, very quickly, the, the one or the other will dominate. <clears throat> what we can do in aircraft design, we use this uh, little um, environmental uh, atmosphere model. Um, so I cannot go in all these details, but you see kind of the complexity, which is manageable. Um, and then you arrive at equivalent CO2 mass. And you need to take account of the altitude effect, which you see here in that graph. Altitude on the left-hand side and the forcing factor. So especially for aviation-induced cloudiness, you see that at about 33,000 feet, um, there is a peak in aviation-induced cloudiness. Um, the cirrus clouds are more important than the contrails by themselves. Our model was giving that ratio with three. This publication is giving the ratio with four. And if you make a full account and you go to a life cycle assessment, you have all these kinds of influences on Earth. But for aviation, it's climate change and then the fossil fuel depletion. Um, and that in the end goes into a single score. And you can use that single score to optimize the airplane, to say design an airplane such that my single score is a minimum. Now, what we have done, we have taken a pretty uh, unique um, um, generalized airplane. Uh, if there was anything uh, we needed to uh, specify more in detail, it was model like the A220. And you see here altitude increasing to the bottom, uh, Mach number increasing to the right. And when you fly here in the green area, then you are quite good in your environmental impact. Um, and what is calculated, it is this life cycle assessment mix 50-50 between resource depletion and engine emissions. So you see if you stay below say 7,000 feet, you have almost no influence. If we put that in numbers, then we see that our equivalent CO2 mass goes down uh, to uh, by 78%. The fuel consumption goes up by 5.6%. Um, so that also will increase our resource depletion. So overall, the environmental impact um, is going down only in quotes by 70%. Um, and due to the fuel burn that was increasing roughly some 6%, the DOC go up by 0.6%. So we could make a change tomorrow, fly lower, um, reduce the environmental impact, and pay 0.6% more. This obviously doesn't happen because no one is willing to pay 0.6% more, and therefore we have aviation as it stands today. It would be good to have an eco label so that passengers see exactly what's going on. Here, the Boeing 747 from Lufthansa, not coming out very favorable with an F. A is best, G is worse. And uh, you can see the fuel performance, equivalent CO2, noise, local air pollution. And for the fuel, you see that there's quite a bit of difference uh, depending where you sit because it's taking the square meters you occupy. Now engines, propulsion, and the aircraft. We start with hydrogen. This is Airbus' proposal as we've seen it. At Airbus, we have the ambition to develop the world's first zero emission commercial aircraft by 2035. Zero Avia um, negated that claim a couple of days later. But zero emission is never possible 
if we are humans, we exhale, exhale CO2. We may also have as human beings sometimes a CH4, a methane problem. So nothing is zero emission. Also look at the details. This is one proposed airplane. 220 or 200 passengers should go in. You look at the door. If you assume it's a type A door, you can evacuate 110 passengers. If you look at the proportions, you see that maybe 20 passengers will fit into this proposal of an airplane. Airbus said it's just a nice rendering. It's a picture. It has never been calculated. They are not calculating um, any uh, details. They are just in the concept phase. Here we see what parts of the combustion um, and emissions is not taking place if we have hydrogen uh, crossed out in red. And if you make a calculation with the atmospheric simple model, as I've shown to you, then you see that this is the kerosene airplane and this is the hydrogen airplane. And it's making the best assumptions whatsoever about reduction in aviation induced cloudiness due to larger ice crystals and super duper lean combustion for reduced NOx. You won't get it any better as this. And you see if you cruise a normal cruise altitude, the environmental effect with a liquid hydrogen airplane is the same as with a kerosene airplane. But you are not having the long lasting uh, CO2 effect because the CO2 is gone. Now, what is the timeline for Airbus? Look into Flight Global from 1995. They said they plan to fly a Dawn A328 with hydrogen power in 1980, 1998. So 23 years ago, they said they want to fly with hydrogen. So the question is, what will happen in the next 23 years to come? And here you see is that's more um, um, confidential EU briefing to Timmermans, and they say the 200 seat airplane will come in 2050 when it is too late because this is the time when we want to be at zero emission already. Now hydrogen and self combined. The problem is that we need more primary energy. And here you see the efficiencies of the processes. The primary energy factor for liquid hydrogen is 1.7. We need 1.7 times the renewable energy, uh, which is uh, allocated here as 100%. And if we use uh, power to liquid, um, then the factor is 4.6. And that comes from the hydrogen powered aviation um, document from the EU. But these numbers vary quite a bit. So, how much? Um, renewable energy do we need to get a feel for that? We want fuel in A350 once a day. Here is the most modern, biggest wind power plant, 4.6 megawatt. In order to fuel in A350 once a day, we need 52 of these gigantic wind power plants. And here the efficiencies are given to calculate that. You can do it with a pocket calculator quite easily. Now, the gigawatts that we need for aviation to uh, fuel uh, with renewable energy is 500 to 1,500 gigawatts. And all the wind power and solar power is 500 gigawatts each. So it means all that we have, all the renewable energy on Earth needs to double to provide uh, what aviation needs. Now, is it smart to put renewable energy in an airplane or would it be better to substitute a coal power plant and you see how much CO2 you save if you put it in an airplane and how much CO2 you save if you put it or if you avoid the coal power plant and you divide the uh, 0.9 by 0.057 and then you see that you would save 15.7 times if you replace the coal power plant. So don't put it in your airplane or otherwise build your own renewable energy sources and don't take it away from anyone else. 
it's not as bad for liquid hydrogen, the factor is 6.3 roughly. So if we talk about SAF, then obviously it only works if we take the carbon out that we have put in. And that should be done with direct air capture or some tricky processes with a, um, a biogas generator. And, and here you, you get the carbon cycle, but you need electricity not only for your fuel, you also need lots of electricity for direct air capture, which is normally not accounted for. And you see that you have an effect also from the NOx and from the uh, water, and that you will also need to take out. So you need to take out more CO2 than you put back in, because if you fly, you make global warming by a factor of three also do by these other constituents. What about electric flight? Little calculation and you have a chart and you can read the range and it is not much, it's not sufficient. You can fill your airplane with batteries, but then you cannot make any money anymore. So what about hybrid electric? Your power plant will be three times the mass because you replace the gas turbine, you put it here in the back, and you also need a generator. So instead of having one gas turbine, you have now the gas turbine here and two electric components. The battery is not necessary in that case. If you use it, it even adds up weight. So the project was canceled, although it was quite favorable seen when it was inaugurated. Now I want briefly to talk about uh, all these propellers on the front of the wing. And I am an air drift designer, so I knew the equation to calculate engine uh, out uh, situations. So climb with one engine inoperative. This is the equation. And the sine gamma is the climb gradient that the certification rules demand. It's 2.4 if we have two engines, 2.7 if we have three and 3% 3 if we have four engines. Now, what happens if we have five and six, not specified. But if you think it would go on like this, then you see we have the red curve and we need more thrust than we would use before. And the question is also, if we have 20 propellers, 20 engines, will it be sufficient to account only for one failing? So we need to look at this uh, factor and we have various curves and we see then instead of having these three points, we could end up on a curve, which is asking for a higher uh, thrust than before. So people say we should have lots of propellers. If you increase the number of propellers, they get smaller and smaller. In the end, you have just a tiny line on your wing and your propeller area is zero. So the optimum would probably be something like four propellers, but not what we often see. So I come to my summary. Um, air mobility is for the rich, no benefit to the environment, no reduction in congestion. Short range is for the train. Medium range between mega cities is for the train. Medium range operation for um, other city pairs. You use a propeller aircraft with a turboprop. You make it smart design. Hydrogen could be used. For long range, you use drop-in fuel. Um, so use SAF, but get the CO2 really out of the atmosphere, otherwise you are cheating. And you need high primary energy, so a, a big factor, you need to take it. You could use hydrogen, but that would make your aircraft quite inefficient, so there's not much benefit getting from hydrogen in long range. Um, you should uh, fight for publishing fuel consumption, not having that secret, and uh, promote the eco-label so that passengers have a good choice. Um, make decisions based on a life cycle analysis. Uh, aviation has a water problem, aviation induced cloudiness, it's less so a CO2 problem, but CO2 dominates in the long run, don't forget. Flying lower is quite interesting. Battery electric flight only works on very short range. Um, very special situations, as we've seen in Scotland or Vancouver, that does make sense. Hybrid electric flight for passenger aircraft does not make fly sense. Hybrid electric may make sense in other situations, but not in passenger aircraft. Um, burning hydrogen, 
um, is avoiding the CO2, um, but you have uh, other implications. So in the end, we need to consider something that we all do not want to hear. We heard it in our uh, starting speech today that flying less is not a good idea for aviation enthusiasts, but maybe there's no way around and we need to fly less because we don't have any other solution. And that's it from my side. Thanks for listening. Thank you very, thank you very much, Professor Schultz. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time for questions right now. We need to move on to our next speaker, but Professor Schultz will be joining us again for the panel session later on. So there'll be an opportunity to ask questions then. So uh, thank you, Professor.